makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Anna Edwards in for Francine Lacroix in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Back to back is back. Jerome Powell leaves the door open to consecutive rate hikes with Christine Lagarde and Andrew Bailey also seeing more tightening as inflation remains sticky. As noted in the FOMC's summary of economic projections, a strong majority of committee participants expect that it will be appropriate to raise interest rates two or more times by the end of this year. No stress. Wall Street's top banks all passed the Fed's annual resiliency tests, clearing a key hurdle for returning billions of dollars to shareholders. We will watch their stocks in pre-market trading. Also ahead, our weekly special focus on the biggest challenges facing Britain. This morning, we look at the UK's water crisis and a damning report on the country's climate goals. Good morning, everybody. 9.01 here in London. First, let's get a check on the markets then. This is the picture across European equity markets right now. Well, we're flat. Uh, Stock 600 not moving anywhere in a hurry. We have a bit of divergence around the various sectors, but essentially flat. Some of those companies reporting in the retail space moving a little higher this morning, but broadly flat. S&P futures also flat. NASDAQ futures had that micron news to digest overnight, but NASDAQ futures flats are positive up but almost a tenth of a percent. The euro uh, also pretty flat today, 109.19. Christine Lagarde said yesterday that there's still more to do in terms of the hiking. July, we've got that message from Sintra, seems to be a fait accompli, we heard from policymakers, but nobody, none of those on the ECB governing council want to be drawn on what happens in September. The German two-year yield, really interesting to see that ticking higher this morning. Uh, that's on the back of the Spanish CPI print, which came in just a shade above expectations even though it's sort of a victory in terms of the inflation fight in Europe. It's now down below 2% at 1.6%. But we are getting in the German context some numbers coming through from uh, various regions which are stepping up. We've stepped up in North Rhine-Westphalia. Uh, we have stepped back up in Hesse. And the number for Bavaria coming through, that also a step up. And the number for Brandenburg, also a little bit of a step up. So some of those numbers just hitting the Bloomberg terminal, re, uh, reasserting this message that perhaps we're not quite done with, uh, with uh, the fight against inflation in Germany and then the broader eurozone. Let's have a look at the European equity market map then to uh, pull out any areas of divergence. There's quite a bit of grey on that screen today. Certainly Germany is in grey, the Netherlands in grey. We, we, we don't see big moves essentially on these European equity markets today. Uh, we're down two tenths of a percent on the stock 600. The CAC Courant up a tenth of a percent, that getting the best of the gains of the major markets. The FTSE MIB though actually in Italy up by half a percent. Let's return to some of the macro uh, major themes this morning. The Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said at least two interest rate increases are likely necessary this year to bring the inflation rate down to the US central bank's 2% target. Powell and other central bankers have been speaking at the ECB forum in Sintra. We still have ground to cover. Although policy is restrictive, it's not, it may not be restrictive enough and it, and it has not been restrictive for long enough. We are data dependent. Uh, we will decide on a meeting-by-meeting meeting basis. We will be evidence-driven, so we will wait for the next set of evidence for our next meeting. Underlying inf inflation is still a bit lower than 2%. That's, be that's why we are keeping policy unchanged at the moment. If our baseline uh, stands, then we also know that uh, we will very likely hike again in, uh, in July. We're going to move the, move the decisions a little bit, make them a little bit, with a little bit more time in between them. We will do what is necessary. I wouldn't take, you know, moving a consecutive meetings off the table at all. Central bank governors on the battle against inflation there. Joining us now, UBS chief strategist, Banu Bawaja, uh, with us this morning to talk about these markets. Very good to see you, Banu. Thank you for joining us here on The Pulse. Uh, let me ask you about what your base case is then for Fed tightening, because that seems to be one of the, the major factors driving uh, markets, or it had been, certainly, mm -hmm. <laughs> in, re in recent weeks. Maybe, maybe not always these days. What are you assuming then? Are you assuming we do get back to back-to-back rate rises, what's your expectation? The base case is that we don't, right? Base case is that we see one rate hike from the Fed, and then the Fed stands pat. Towards the end of the year, there may even be a cut, and next year they cut more than what's priced in, right? So we have to understand where the Fed is coming from. Last year, they made the mistake of saying inflation is temporary, or, you know, in 2021, as well, they said inflation is temporary. Inflation may be temporary, but it wasn't three-month temporary, probably three-year temporary, and I think they're trying to gain back credibility, saying all central banks are trying to gain back credibility, saying that we are going to hike till we kill this beast. Any central bank, when they're going to make a decision, they try to understand what is the least worst outcome. 
right? The least worst outcome right now is not that they put it into a recession. The least worst outcome is that um, they, in fact, go hiking right now. What they don't want to see is that economy starts to reaccelerate and you begin to see inflation reaccelerate. That's why they're sounding as hawkish as they are. But here's the truth. Inflation is already declining, right? A headline level, it is declining. In the U.S., which is different from Europe, and we'll speak about that in a second, mm. core inflation is also declining. So from the next print onwards, which is the June print, which is going to be released in July, we're expecting a whole string of about 0.2. So inflation's coming off hot. We think one, but if the labor market holds up as well as it has, it should not, okay. but if it holds up as well as it has, then, then it's probably two. Okay, that's interesting. So I'll, we'll get to the Europe conversation in just a moment, but just to push you a bit more on the Fed uh, or get a bit more detail from you, you say that you expect more cuts than a priced in was that in the second half of the year sorry or next year that's next year that's next year uh, so i mean if we're going to get cuts not just a pause from the fed yes. that's certainly i mean it's not what the fed is is signaling it's going to do is Absolutely. it does that assume quite a negative outturn then for the u.s economy so the fed does not so there, there are two issues on which we disagree with the fed in their scp forecast first we think that inflation is going to drop straight away now so it's, you know from june onwards we get 0 0.2 so the fed starts accumulating forecast error that's point one Point two is that we do expect a recession later this year, and the Fed does not, right? So we're thinking Q4, Q1 next year, we're going to get a recession, a mild recession, but a recession nonetheless that takes the unemployment rate to about 5% and slightly higher than that. And that's why we're expecting rate cuts. The market has, remember, the two-year rate has already moved up. At, at one point post-SVB, the market was making the opposite mistake, where rates had gone down far too much, and it was pricing the Fed far too dovishly. I think the market is now pricing in Fed 2023 appropriately, but for 2024, the market is pricing the Fed too hawkishly. So if you're looking for a mild recession, what does investment strategy look like around that kind of scenario? You know, I think people don't respect mild recessions as much as they should because, <laughs> because they're most a mild recession. Why should I get out of bed? You know, I'm uh -huh. just going to buy the dip all the time. But a mild recession, you know, which is a modest decline in real GDP, does not necessarily mean a modest decline in prices, right? In prices in the market, that is, right? Because you're assuming two things, that a mild recession is going to lead to no decline in prices because, A, margins are at equilibrium, and B, P is valuations are at equilibrium. And they're not. Margins are well above equilibrium, and P, E is well, well above equilibrium. Right. So, so you can see a modest decline in real GDP lead to a pretty significant decline in prices in the market. So I think we are cautious on the market. Well, I do concede that it will take some time for the earnings drawdown, which is going to be the real reason why market goes down. It's going to take some time for that to show up. I think that's going to be late Q3, Q4. But today, where vol is, where correlation is, where skew is, all of these are telling you that this is not a worried market. So mm. central bankers are worried about recession. The narrative in investors' minds is worried about recession. The market price, make no mistake, right. is not pricing in recession. Okay, you see it's sort of, it's, there's a vulnerability in the sort of expensiveness of things then. Um, but what about the European story then? You say in your notes, Banner, you're ahead of our conversation, the ECB front end is mispriced relative to the Bank of England, I think. What's the, what's the story for you then that, that, that leads you to that conclusion? I think, I think core inflation in Europe is fundamentally different from core inflation in the US in that real wages have been so negative for so long that I think people will try, workers will try in Europe to try and raise nominal wages for some time. So the basic difference is that as wages are coming down in, in the US, they may not come down in Europe at quite the same pace. So there may be a little more wage price memory in Europe than there is in the US. This is a less flexible labor market anyway, right? Mm. So you can possibly see headline inflation come off hard, energy, food in particular. Food has not yet come down and is likely to come down, but core inflation can remain high. So I think Schnabel is really on the ball on this. And she has been saying that we need to bring core inflation lower and we need to bring inflation expectations lower. So I, I suspect that ECB is mispriced relative not just to the Bank of England, but also relative to the Fed. So does that open the door to the ECB continuing hiking, what, September and beyond then? Potentially, yes. So we think the September, we think we will see a hike in September, but there is a possibility that even beyond that, when the Fed is standing pat, that the ECB does hike. So it's not a given that if the Fed stands back that everyone else does. There are differences in central banks, perhaps not as stark as between the Bank of Japan and, and, and the Federal Reserve, but nonetheless differences between central banks. And that, that pulls up the euro? Creates I, I think it, for exporters? Yes, I think it can take it to 113 to 115. But remember, right now, eurozone growth is abysmal right now, right? So you will see some lift for the euro as the front end goes up, but I think that will stall at between 113 to 115 this year. What do, what do credit spreads look like to you, Banu? If we're looking at a, a mild recession, sorry, not a wild one, but a mild recession, what does that do to credit spreads? You know, if you look at US high yield credit spreads, they are priced not for a recession. You know, 
our, our day job is to look at economic data and say what financial markets we do. But if you reverse that and look at what financial markets are saying about economic data, you will see that U.S. high yield spreads are actually pricing in not even close to a recession. They're pricing in well above trend growth, right? So U.S. high yield spreads, we think, are phenomenally tight at these levels, extremely tight and extremely rich. So we think there'll be a decompression and we see wides of U.S. high yield spreads over the next three to four months of about 625 to 650 basis points. Right now, just to put this in perspective, we're at 410, mm. right? So we see a, more than a 200 basis points widening in high yield spreads and that'll matter for equities. Okay. It'll matter for valuations as well. Banu, thank you so much. Really nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. UBS Chief Strategist Banu Bawaja with us this morning on The Pulse. Let's have a look at where we are on a, a, a pre-market uh, pre moving story over in the, U the US. Micron, the chip maker, up in, in pre-market. You can see the pre-market move there up by just over 3%, 3 3.06. Three uh, Maybe some upside then created for some others in the sector. We've got uh, AMD, NVIDIA, Intel on the board all showing some modest move higher. Micron delivering a strong forecast in a sign that the glut is easing. Uh, that seems to be the pitch coming through from this particular uh, business, calling the sales trough, suggesting things get better from here. And that certainly is pushing that share price a little higher in pre-market. Let's get to some of the other corporate stories that we are uh, covering for you today. Bloomberg has learned that a Siemens energy wind turbine defect could cost upwards of 1 billion euros. Executives at the renewable firm are concerned that the issue, a turbine base that has been found to twist and damage parts, could exceed their cost estimates. That could determine the viability of a business at the core of Europe's long-term climate goals. Sticking with utilities and Thames water bonds tumbled in yesterday's session after reports that Britain's biggest water company is in talks with officials over contingency plans, which could include a temporary nationalisation. The Thames water debt crisis is a new problem to add to the issues facing the UK government. And we will talk more about the problems at Thames water in our weekly UK show. That's coming up at half past this hour, so in around 20 minutes time, 9.30 London time. EU leaders are in Brussels today with China, Russia and the war in Ukraine among the items topping their summit agenda. We're there live on the ground. Next, we'll bring you an update. This is The Pulse. The conversations that matter and the insights you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Anna Edwards in for Francine Lacroix here in London. European leaders are gathering in Brussels today after the dramatic events in Russia last weekend and following the ECB Central Bank Forum in Portugal. Europe's uh, uh, Bloomberg's Europe correspondent Maria Tadeo joins us now on the ground with the assembled world media attending this, uh, this leaders' meeting then. Maria, the ECB Forum wrapped up yesterday. How will the hawkish messages be received? Because we heard quite a lot of hawkishness about the, the fait accompli of a July rate hike and, and some speculation around September. Uh, yes, Anna, and persistent for as long as inflation stays uh, persistent. Uh, and in, but Anna, you know, uh, there's this almost understanding, and you know this very well, between the politicians and uh, the central bank that the politicians do not comment on the ECB and the European Central Bank stays out of politics. And that has usually been the case. But I think now we're seeing some discontent uh, to some extent when you hear the Italian Prime Minister, uh, Giorgia Meloni, this week say when you continue to increase rates this way, well, the uh, Sees could actually be at this point a problem, but the curse could be, or the way to cure it could be even worse. I think what you're also seeing now is a real debate behind the scenes here as to whether the European Central Bank will be able to orchestrate this soft landing, this idea that you tame inflation, but you maintain some level of growth. And if we do see a downturn, well, for a lot of uh, politicians, that is something they have to explain to their voters, and then it becomes a political story. So, yes, there is a separation between the two of them, but I would argue there is now a growing debate, especially when you look at some of the data that we've seen recently about this soft landing. Can they do it? Can they get it done? Also, when you look at the data coming out of Spain today, yes, headline inflation below 2%, but funnily enough, in that country, and there's an election coming up, the economy is not really playing a major role in the election campaign. Yeah, that's a really interesting dynamic to watch. Uh, also on the agenda, or at least uh, to, to some degree, eclipsing all the other things on the agenda, I suppose, Russia's war in Ukraine, then, Maria. That and the events in Russia itself clearly will be discussed. 
Yes, and Anna, on that note, we should make clear that this summit was already in the agenda. Like, it's not a response to the events that we saw play out in Russia, but of course, European leaders are expected to debrief uh, the situation. We see once again how the war in Ukraine eclipses a lot of the politics here in this region, that instability that has kicked off as a result of the war. And by the way, we're also expecting now that the head of NATO, the Secretary General, Mr. Stoltenberg, will join European leaders for a working lunch today. And on that note, Anna, Mr. Stoltenberg, the whispers now in Brussels suggest that he will stay on the job for another year. Remember, he was supposed to leave in 2022. Then, the, uh, of course, a war broke out. He was extended for a year. And now it looks like he's going to stay for another year, too. Okay, Maria, thanks very much. Being based Maria today, uh, well placed as we can very clearly see at that EU Leaders Summit. Thank you very much, Maria, for bringing us the uh, things we need to know about that. Now, sticking with Russia, uh, with heavy sanctions and tightening economic conditions, Moscow has been pivoting its gas sales away from delivering gas to the West. Uh, but where does all the banned Russia gas go to? Here with us, Bloomberg Senior Executive Editor for Energy Co and Commodities, Will Kennedy. Good to have you with us uh, again, Will. Uh, let me ask you then about what's happening with Russian gas. Let's stick to gas for the moment before broadening the conversation. Essentially, the pipe Lines, the majority of the pipelines point to, to, to Western economies, and that's not where the gas is, is needed to go these days. Absolutely. Russia's gas industry was built up around, from the 1960s onwards, supplying Europe through these long pipelines that run from Siberia all the way into Germany and other places in Western Europe. Um, and those pipelines aren't needed anymore because uh, Europe has decided to stop buying that gas. It still buys some Russian LNG, but it's not buying any Russian pipeline gas. So the difficulty Russia has is to find new markets for that gas and it's using more in some places domestically. It would love to be able to sell more to China, but there's only one pipeline and it's not connected to the broader network. It's talking about a second pipeline, but the Chinese are lukewarm. So what we have is, in contrast to oil, a market drop in Russian gas production. It's, yes. it's running at 13% less this year than the previous year, and that's really biting into uh, government revenues. OK, so less money from gas sales then to, to, to wage war in Ukraine. If the gas is, is, it needs moving, you need a pipeline or you need an LNG infrastructure. And if you don't have that, it's costly to create, as we've seen in parts of Europe. On the oil side of things, though, if the market moves and you need to send it somewhere else, it's a little bit easier to move it where it needs to go. That's exactly right. With oil, uh, you need to get it onto a tanker and then you're pretty free to sail it to wherever you'd like. And obviously, Russia used to sell a lot of oil to Europe and Europe has stopped buying that Russian oil. But what Russia has been able to do, uh, partly with the blessing of the price cap regime to limit prices while keeping the oil flowing, it's been able to sell that oil to India and, and Russia. And India, for example, is buying huge amounts of Russian gas uh, oil where it didn't before. And you've seen a real reordering in the global oil market in a way with a flexibility that's not possible in the gas market. OK, Will, thanks very much. Thanks for the insights. Bloomberg's Will Kennedy uh, with a focus on the gas and oil markets and where the oil and gas has been going from Russia. Coming up on the programme, we hear from the Greek central bank governor on the country's fight against inflation. That's next. This is The Pulse. <laughs> If the baseline um, develops as we think, then perhaps, yes, in July, we're going to have a hike. There are good news. Inflation is falling. Um, past decisions um, um, will have an impact from now on as well. We also uh, tighten our, our balance sheet. So all in all, I think uh, we are following the path we have planned. That's the Greek central bank governor, Yanis uh, Stournadesras, uh, speaking there, talking to Bloomberg about interest rates and expressing confidence uh, that his country will regain, regain investment grade status soon. Of course, the recent election, uh, critical perhaps to that. Let me just dive into some data we've had out of Germany. Slowly through the morning, bit by bit, we've been building up a picture of German inflation. And we get the full German number later on, early afternoon European time. And we're just getting another region to add to the mix, so Baden-Württemberg, 
is the latest one, ticking up from 6.6 .6 to 6.9. And so we've seen all the regions, Brandenburg, Bavaria, Hesse, North Rhine-Westphalia, they've all ticked up from the prior month. So the month of June turning, uh, turning out to be a period where we get a step up in inflation in the German story, even though we've seen quite a step down in the Spanish story. We got those numbers earlier on this morning. That's having an impact, I should say, on bond markets. Let's take a look at the stories that we have caught our attention this morning. The alleged Chinese spy balloon that floated over the continental US earlier this year was reportedly equipped with American-made surveillance gear. That is according to the Wall Street Journal. The paper says an analysis by US agencies of debris recovered after the balloon was shot down found that the craft had been filled with commercially available American equipment and more specialized Chinese sensors. The creator of ChatGPT, OpenAI, is being sued in a class action lawsuit. The suit alleges the AI bot breaks the law by secretly scraping private information from the Internet without consent on a, quote, unprecedented scale. An OpenAI spokesperson didn't immediately respond to, uh, f for comment from Bloomberg. Back to the markets then. I mentioned some of the moves in the German bond market that we're seeing as a result of the data we're building up on the German inflation story and the Spanish uh, data, perhaps uh, adding to that a little bit, even though it came down versus the prior month. It was a little higher than expected, uh, but that's the picture on the German bond, uh, bond, market, bond market. You can see it at the bottom there. Stocks going nowhere in a hurry, it seems, in terms of the European story and US futures. Euro dollar flat. Keeping uh, a focus on the UK next, coming up, a deep dive into the UK's net zero climate commitment. This is Bloomberg.